Um, so this morning, I'm excited to be able to continue in the series that we've been doing. Again, if you're newer to the church, um, one of the things that we're kind of wrestling with as a church right now is eldership. And so a couple weeks ago, we shared with all of us, with the congregation, the work of the ministry model team and some recommendations, <coughs> excuse me, to the trustees um, and about elders. And so at all of our campuses, we are going to be raising up elders. And so we've been in this short little series just for the month of May, looking a little bit more in depth at what eldership looks like. And I thought it would be maybe valuable to take a couple minutes here at the beginning to recap a little bit of where we've been over the last couple of weeks. So two weeks ago, we started out the series and we started out talking about us, all of us. And we said one of the components, one of the, the uh, identities that the scriptures gives us is, do you remember what it is? Priests, right? Like we are a kingdom of priests, a holy, royal priesthood. And we said what that means is a few things that are really important for us to grasp. Number one, we're specially chosen by God, right? Number two, we have direct, intimate access directly with God. And then number three, we have a responsibility to help other people experience that direct access with God as well. And then we ended the time saying, and by the way, we're not just a bunch of individual priests, but we're a priesthood together. We're part of something much bigger than any of us. And so we said, the elders that we're gonna be raising up here at our church are actually priests. The elders are part of this holy royal priesthood, right? So that was the first week. Last week, Tim kind of shifted over and started talking more specifically about who these leaders of the church are, who are the elders. And so he started out looking at um, one passage, Philippians, one verse actually, Philippians chapter one, verse one. It's kind of a cool thing. In that one verse, you see the totality of the church and the one whom the church worships. And so you see in that passage, uh, Jesus. You see the apostles represented in Paul and Timothy. You see overseers is the word that's used there, which I'll talk about here in a second. Overseers or elders. You see deacons, and then you see the saints, which is all of us together, just in that one passage. And so then he started looking more specifically at the office of elder because that's the part that's new to us as a church. And we said that there's different Greek words. There's actually three different Greek words that are used to define, to describe this one office. As best we understand it, all three of these words or all three of these names refer to the same office. Um, they bring out different qualities of the role of elder. And it's similar to like, um, I think of it this way. So uh, one of my titles, one of my roles is dad, right? And so to my kids, I'm dad. When they were younger, I was daddy. Now I'm just dad. Sometimes my son just calls me Jeff. Hey, Jeff. He thinks it's cool. I don't know. But I'm dad to them. Uh, to the schools, I'm the parent's guardian. To, to them, I'm the provider, right, to my kids. I'm, I'm the protector to them. I'm the head of household for tax purposes, right? Like, it's all the same role. It's all dad. But each one of those different titles brings out kind of different nuance to the role. And we said these three words that, we, um, that all refer to the same office of elder do something similar. So the first one is elder. The Greek word is presbyteros. And we said what that means, literally what it means is an older person. And so the quality of this, this office that it brings out is maturity, wisdom, right? The second one is overseer. Sometimes it's translated as bishop. The Greek word is, pres is uh, episkopos, excuse me. And so literally what that means is somebody who watches over. And so what that brings out is the idea of authority, right, of leadership, and then the last one is translated as either pastor or shepherd. The Greek word is poimen. And what it means, so what is a pastor? Like think of Psalm 23, like what is, or when Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, what does a shepherd do? Well, a shepherd is gentle with his sheep. He cares for them. He nurtures, he protects, he provides, right? And so all of these refer to the same office, but they bring out kind of different nuance to it. And then we gave you a couple definitions last week as well. So we defined elder for us and we defined deacon. You can throw that up on the screen there. So elder is, elders are called by God through the spirit to serve under Christ to shepherd and oversee the church. Very generally, that's what elders slash overseers slash pastors or shepherds do. 
The second one, deacons uh, are called by God similarly through the Spirit to serve under Christ, to nurture the unity of the church by caring for the physical needs of the church. And we've had uh, deacons at our church for a long, long time, and this is exactly what they do. So, so Tim kind of finished out the sermon last week talking about a couple more specifics. He said, um, in the scriptures, all of the churches that we read about, that we know about in the New Testament, had elders, right? All of them. And they didn't just have one elder per church, but they had a plurality of elders, right? They had more than one elder. And you hear that and you go, well, how many did they have? I don't know. We don't know. It's actually not specific, but they had multiple of them. And the purpose was, the purpose of a plurality, multiple elders, is for two, two main things, accountability and collegiality, right? Meaning we're wiser together and we make less mistakes together. Right? Think about that in your own life. Like when we're trying to do life by ourselves or just make mistakes by our, or make decisions by ourselves, often we make more mistakes. But when we seek counsel with other people, we tend to make wiser decisions, better decisions. So we're better together than alone. And then Tim ended last week with just the great reminder for us that, you know, yes, the elders are called to shepherd and lead the church, but really they're under shepherds. Christ is the head. And we never forget that. Sometimes we just assume that. But we shouldn't just assume that. Christ is the head of the church. So, this, so that's the last couple weeks. This week I want to talk about two things. The qualifications of an elder and the heart of an elder. The qualifications of an elder and the heart of an elder. And I'm guessing that maybe some of us in this room hear this and we, we might be a little bit tempted to zone out a little bit. Because, you know, we're struggling to find the relevance of what this means personally for us. Because maybe in your mind you're thinking, I'm not going to be an elder. What does this have to do with me, right? Well, I'd say a couple things with that. One, it's not just about us, right? Like one of the beautiful things, and we stressed this the first week, is that we're part of something bigger. We're a priesthood together. We're not just thinking about ourselves. We're a connected body together. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and I'm going to give away... I went back and forth on this all week. I'm gonna give away like the final point of my message because I think it's important for us to kind of to know this ahead of time going into it. What's so fascinating about what we're gonna look at, all the different qualifications and like the heart of an elder, is that none of these things are unique to elders. None of them are. Essentially, all of the qualifications of elders apply. You'll see it in other places of the scriptures. We go through this, you'll go, oh yeah, I remember in this passage it says something similar. In this passage it says something similar. All of these things essentially apply to all of the church, to all of the saints, to all of the priests, right? You'll see them in other times in the scriptures. So all of this stuff applies to us. For an elder, the, the accountability is higher, right? But all of these things that we're going to talk about as we go through it, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at your own heart and go, okay, th I, these are things that we should be looking for in the elders as we raise them up, but I should also be looking at myself and saying, how am I doing with this? How am I living this out? Am I struggling to, to do these things and to live this way as well? Does that make sense? Okay, so let me pray for us and then we're going to jump in. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for uh, just the, the beauty of new life. And these baptisms are just such a beautiful example of that. You calling people and transforming them. And the hope of uh, it's looking forward at these folks' lives and what you're, how you're going to use them and what you're going to accomplish through them for your church is just, it's beautiful to think about, God. And thank you that you're here with us right now. And as we wrestle with all of these things with elders and what that's going to look like, and we have lots of work to do with it, but I pray that you would unite our hearts this morning, get us on the same page as we begin to look at these qualities or these qualifications in the heart of an elder God. Also help us, convict us to search our own hearts and how we're doing with these things. So Father, we give you this time and we trust you in Christ's name, amen. All right, so why don't you grab a Bible and open it up, <coughs> excuse me, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. So we're going to pick up in verse 1. So there are two places in the New Testament 
that we get that uh, qualifications of elders and deacons. One of them is what we're going to look at here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The other is in Titus chapter 1. And so both Timothy and Titus were young uh, pastor church planters that Paul, the apostle Paul, was writing to and he was mentoring. And so we're just going to look at the first part here, the elder part, for time's sake. But I would encourage you in your own time this week, read through the qualifications of deacons. They're actually very similar. There's a lot of overlap there, but there's a little bit of nuance as well. And let me just be clear here. Pastor Bob, uh, Wednesday in our sermon discussion meeting, Pastor Bob brought this up, and and, um, he was right on. I was so glad he said this. Um, Maybe we just assume this, and we shouldn't assume this. The starting point for church leaders, maybe the, the foundational qualification is what it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 3. So we looked at this weeks ago when going through the Acts series. But what Acts 6, 3 says is that the leaders of the church should be men who are full of two things. You know what it is? The spirit and wisdom, right? The leaders of the church are men who should be full of the spirit and full of wisdom. Really, the rest of the qualifications that we're gonna look at this morning only have power when they're built on that foundation. These are people who are full of the spirit and full of wisdom, right? So it's important for us to get that. Otherwise, as we go through this, it just sounds like a list that maybe could even be applied to things outside the church, right? To any sort of job description. That's not what it is. The foundation is a fullness of the spirit and fullness of wisdom, okay? So here we go. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. This is a, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer or elder, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not gentle, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Okay. So there you go. So this is the first kind of cluster of qualifications for elders. As we begin to raise up elders at our church, these are the things that we should be looking for. So there's a lot here. Um, Let's jump right into this. Look back at verse one. So he says, the saying is trustworthy. (coughs) Excuse me. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble work. So maybe the first thing for us to note here is that the responsibility of being an elder, of being an overseer, is a noble one that that should be desired, that we should desire, that we should aspire to. It's good. It's honorable. It's worthy of our time and attention. Many things aren't worthy of our time and attention. This is. And I think implicit in this statement by Paul is that as such, because it's something that, we, that is honorable, the rest of us should honor and respect those that are in this role, right? Like we, we saw, we saw this last year through our pastors and our trustees, this can be a very, very challenging job. This can be a very, very challenging responsibility. And so the thought is to to honor those that are in those positions. And I think the chapel has a long, long history of doing that with pastors and trustees and deacons already. So that said, let's look at the qualifications. So that's kind of the the foundation there. There's 14 different qualifications. That's a lot of them. Um, So we're going to have to go through them quickly. But I think giving some thought to each of them is worthy of our time and attention as we have to do this, as, as we have to raise up elders among us. We need to know what it is that we're looking for. So here we go. So here's the first one. First one. So they start in verse two, right? Here's the first one. Above reproach. An elder should be, an overseer should be above reproach. Above reproach means blameless. It means not guilty of things that one might be accused of. That that there's no grounds for legitimate criticism 
Of course, it doesn't mean perfection because we know that there's no such thing on this side of eternity. But no legitimate charge can be brought against you because you're one who takes your sin very seriously and you deal with it properly between you and God, right? The elder is to be somebody who is above reproach. The next one, husband of one wife. A one-woman man. So there's lots of different thoughts on this one. This is kind of one of the more controversial qualities. There's a lot of differing opinions as to what exactly that means, that the elder is to be a husband of one wife. Some people take that to mean they have to be married. You have to have a wife. You have to have one wife. And you think about that and you go, well, I mean, then that would immediately disqualify Jesus and that would immediately disqualify Paul. You think, I, that doesn't seem like that's what Paul is writing here. Some people understand it to mean you can't, <coughs> excuse me, you can't be divorced, right? In order to be an elder, you cannot be divorced. You have to have the husband, you, you are a husband of a wife, of one wife. But again, that, like, if that's what Paul was referring to here, why didn't he just say you shouldn't be divorced or you can't be divorced? Divorce should definitely, if somebody is aspiring to be an elder and they have a divorce in their past, it's definitely something that should be properly you know, investigated or maybe understood as a better word. But that doesn't seem to be the thrust of this qualification either. Some take it to mean they can't be remarried. It can't be somebody he's, who's remarried, either divorced and remarried or widowed and remarried because then you're not the husband of one wife. You're the husband of more than one wife, right? What I think in kind of our stance here at the church is that what this is talking to, talking about is polygamy. So meaning he shouldn't have two wives, which was fairly common back then. And so we would understand the husband of one wife to mean, you know, one who honors the sanctity of biblical marriage. So one who is faithful to his wife, if he has one, and has honor for the sanctity of marriage as described here. Does that make sense? Uh, it's also, <coughs> excuse me, assumed in these verses that elders or overseers are men. So this was, you know, it's, so it's a husband of one wife. This is why one of the reasons why we look at elders and we say we believe that this office is reserved for men. That was, without a doubt, the practice in the early church. And notice the, the use of masculine pro, pronouns here in all of these things. And, and a lack of the phrase, wife of one husband. You know, if this was something for women as well, then you would think that Paul would have specified that. And so it was pretty clearly assumed in the early church that the role of elder, overseer, pastor was filled by men. Deacons is different, right? When you read through the scriptures, you see um, deaconesses as well. Phoebe is an example of that. But when we look through the scriptures, the role, the office of elder um, seems to be reserved for a man. The next one is sober-minded. Sober-minded. Sober-minded means calm. This is, this is something that I try to be. I, like, I, I think about this. I, can, I have the tendency sometimes, I don't tend to get too terribly low, but sometimes I can get really high, you know? And what this means is it's like, it's temperate. It's someone who keeps their cool. It's someone who's not easily agitated. They're, they're balanced. They're not given to the extremes. They're somebody who's sober-minded. The next one is self-controlled. Self-control is a fruit of the spirit, right? And so when an elder exhibits this in their life, it's evidence of the spirit's presence in their life. Self-control, we kind of know, all know what that means. It means you're in control of yourself. It's the opposite of out of control. It's also the opposite of being controlled by other things. What other things? Well, things like sin, things like my passions, things like addictions and other things, right? So this is somebody who is in control of themselves under, remember they're filled with the Spirit, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. The next one is respectable. <coughs> Pardon me. Respectable. Respectable means worthy of respect, right? And it kind of begs the question, well, why? Like what, what makes one worthy of respect? 
And so worthy of respect in this context means you've ordered your life well according to Jesus' teachings, right? I've ordered my life well according to what this says here. And so people look at your life as one deserving honor. They look at your life and go, your life is consistent with this. Therefore, you are respectable in my sight. That makes sense? The next one is hospitable. And let me take a little bit more time with this one because this is one that um, the original intent, like when you look at the original language, what Paul meant with that is a little bit different than what the word means in our, in their, in our English context. So we translate it as hospitable. The Greek word is phylloxenos. Phylloxenos. It's kind of fun to say. You can forget that word. But what it means is, it's what it's not like when we think of hospitality, we think of, well, I like to have my family over to my house for Christmas. We host. We're hospitable. Or we think, well, I have a small group. My small group meets at my house. I'm hospitable. But this, that's actually not what the word means. So the word is kind of a smushing together of, of two parts. The first one, philo, P-H-I-L-O. Philo means an openness to or, or given to, or generosity with, okay? The second part of the word is xenos, X-E-N-O-S, xenos, which maybe is a familiar word to some of you. What it means literally is aliens, or foreigners, or strangers. And so what this word phylloxenos means, hospitality means, literally what it means is an openness to strangers, right? And so it's not so much being hospitable, opening up my house to people that I know, people that I love, people that I'm comfortable with, people who think like me. It's different than that. It's an openness to people that I don't know that may think very differently than me, that maybe have no connection to Jesus and no connection to his church. That's what this word means, right? Which I would encourage you, again, like as you're hearing all these things, start thinking about your own life. It's a little easier for us to be hospitable with people that are comfortable to us or people that we know well. We know what to expect. It's different when we open up our home to people that we don't know very well or we're hospitable to them in other ways. The next one is able to teach. Able to teach. So this is someone who is an able teacher and kind of implicit in this is able to teach God's word, right? Like that's the context of this. And so they have an aptitude for it. They have an ability for it. They have a skill. Let me ask you, do they have to be world class? Do they have to be exceptional? Do they have to be the best I've ever heard? Do they have to be charismatic and just a phenomenal teacher? No, no. Paul doesn't say that anywhere in here. But there has to be some ability. And probably important for, for some of us in this room to hear, because I would imagine some of us in here are going, well, you know, I'm doing pretty good with some of these other ones, but I am not a teacher. I cannot teach. Listen, as somebody who, for the better part of the last 20 years, has spent time teaching the young aspiring church leaders in Bible college and seminary classes, ABF leaders and small group leaders, I can tell you this. This is something that you can learn. Teaching is something that you can learn. This is not the thing that it's like, well, either you're born with it or you're not. That's not true. You can learn how to be a good teacher. I have lots of different teaching classes to do that. And I can tell you in my own life, this is something that as I've studied this more and done it more, you grow as a teacher, All right? So this is something that can be learned. I'll come back to that one here in a little bit. So that's the first seven of them, okay? We're halfway, yeah, we're doing good, halfway. The next four are kind of a cluster, a little unique cluster of their own. Sometimes they're referred to as the four knots. So these are four negative qualifications here. So these are four things that the elder is not supposed to be. Here's the first one, not a drunkard. So now we're in verse three, not a drunkard. Literally what that means is given to wine, a drunk. It's probably important to note here <clears throat> that this is not, Paul is not writing a complete prohibition against alcohol. That's actually not what he's saying here. There may be wisdom in that for an elder or for an overseer, but it goes beyond the meaning of the text here. 
Paul's point is that we're not given over to it, right? In a way in which we're no longer self-controlled, but instead we're controlled by the wine. That's where the danger lies, right? Drunkenness and self-control, some of us in our past lives know this from personal experience, are mutually exclusive, right? There is no such thing as somebody who's drunk and has great self-control. That ain't a thing, right? And so self-control, actually, so we referred to that earlier, self-control is, is really um, what all of these four knots are about. All of them in one way or another are about a loss or lack of self-control. So the first one is not a drunkard. The second one is not violent but gentle. And so this, this uh, maybe as some people, especially men, maybe, can have violent tendencies. But God's elder must not be a violent person. Instead, they're to be the opposite of that. They're to be gentle. They're to be tender. They, actually, the Greek word that we translate as gentle, it's interesting. It's a, it, again, it's a little bit different than kind of how we think of the word. It has these undertones of like fairness, of, of equitable, of moderate. That's, that's kind of what the word means. And so I think the point is that the elder isn't out of control with their emotions and angry and gets violent, but instead they're gentle and controlled and fair. The third one is not quarrelsome, not quarrelsome. Not quarrelsome means they're not contentious. They're not stirring up trouble. They're not picking fights that need not be fought. Because there's a selfish aspect to that, right? Like when you fight for your way, you're far less concerned about the strife and the, and the hardship and the frustration that you're stirring up for others. Occasionally, it's appropriate for us to fight for what's good and fight for what's right, usually for the good of other people. There's a selflessness to it. But being quarrelsome is different. There's a selfishness to it. And we're kind of fighting or picking for fighting's sake. And he's saying, that's not appropriate for an elder. The fourth one, the fourth not, is to not love money, not a lover of money. And this is a really important one. Of course, it's one of the things that we're cautioned on repeatedly. So, you know, it's one of the things that the Bible talks about most is to be very, very careful with our money and with our possessions. One of the resources that I consulted with this um, one of the books on my bookshelf is the Holman Bible Commentary. The Holman Bible Commentary is on like First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. It's, it's a little book that talks about a lot of stuff. And, and guess who the author of that book is? Any idea? Probably some of you have it hidden on your bookshelf if you've been here for a long time. The author is our very own Newt Larson. Right? By the way, this was, this was the one, I think I shared a little bit about this a while ago. This, this was the one where when I was an intern about to graduate and they were trying to figure out if they wanted to keep me at the chapel or not, Newt asked me, he's like, hey, I would like you to teach a class, like a midweek elective, we called it back then, on First Thessalonians. I want you to, to teach that with me and I want to evaluate you and give you feedback and you know, essentially see if we want to keep you here. And the book that we used for that class was the Holman Bible commentary that he wrote on 1 Thessalonians, a little intimidating. Anyway, so um, on, on the topic of money, not a money lover, what Newt said in, in regard to this, I thought it was just really insightful, I'll read it to you. He says, the pastor, so he also would look at those three um, titles to be the same office. So he uses the word pastor here. Paul uses the word overseer, it's all the same. The, the pastor, according to Paul, is also not a lover of money. Such a person will have a detachment from wealth and its distractions. He'll be an example of generosity and faithful dependence on God. His goals and decisions will not be influenced by paychecks and benefits. Instead, a pastor has only one devotion, one treasure, God himself. And I thought that's really good. That's really insightful. Newt, if you're watching, that was really good. <laughs> I could still kick your butt in basketball. <laughs> All right, so that's 11 of them. We got, we got three more here, and I got to go quick here. So, so the next one is in verses 4 and 5, manage your family well. So I'll just, I'll read it to you. He must manage his own household well with all dignity 
keeping his children submissive, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? And you see the logic here, right? Like if you're gonna be able, as an elder, elders kind of have a th ruling authority over the local congregation from among their, their raised up, if you're gonna be able to manage the entire church, you should prove faithful in managing and leading your family well. And it's probably important to note here that whereas the second qualification, a husband of one wife, that focuses on the elder's relationship with his spouse, this one, that may manage his family well, focuses on the elder's relationship with his kids, right? And, you know, this is one of those things that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's hard to evaluate, right? Because every parent knows that no parent is perfect, right? And every parent also knows that every child is different and has a mind and will of their own and they make their own decisions. And so what this doesn't mean is that in the elder's household there are no problems. Their kids are perfect and they always do exactly what dad and mom tell them to do. That's not reality, right? What it means is the general mood of the household is a desire for godliness, holiness, and obedience to God. And, and there's a consistency, I think this is part of his point, there's a consistency between what is shown publicly, if you stand on a stage, for example, and what happens in the elder's home, what happens privately. And so there's, there's like a symmetry there between the elder's home life and public life. Does that make sense? The next one is not a recent convert. You're not a recent convert. Verse six, he must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. And I think we can be quick here. The point is that they're not green. They're not inexperienced. They're not given this role too quickly before they're ready, which might bring conceit and pride in them. Instead, they've had some dirt rubbed into them. They've had to walk through some hard times, some disappointing times, some painful times. And through walking through those things, two things, they've seen that God is faithful and they've also proven themselves faithful to him, right? So they must not be a recent convert. Last one, they must be thought well of by outsiders. Last qualifications. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace into a snare of the devil. This is another one that I think could be easily misunderstood. You know, James writes in James chapter four, he says, friendship with the world is enmity against God. And we can read that and go, well, that sounds like the opposite of what Paul is writing here. Paul is saying, you should be thought well of by outsiders. And I think his point is, the people outside of the church that know you, that, that, that see how you conduct your life, if they hear that, if you go, you know what? I'm gonna be an elder in my church. And their response is, what? And a leader in the church? Then you're probably not qualified to be a leader in the church, right? For example, if you're a boss and you're miserable to work for, or you're an employee who's lazy and doesn't take any pride in their work. Or you're the neighbor who, when kids walk through your yard, screams at them, get out of my yard. You know, or maybe you're the family member who, as far as it depends on you, isn't seeking to live at peace with the other members of your family. Or maybe you're the, the person who's always negative, always complaining, never satisfied, never encouraging, never affirming. If those if those qualities define you, then you're probably not qualified to be an elder because people outside of the church will see that and know that. That makes sense? Which again is good for all of us. Even as I say that, you know, like we all struggle with these things at some level. And I think we should all be looking inside of our hearts, inside of our lives and go, well, how am I doing with this? Right? It's a good check for us. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So as you read that list, as you, as you see those, quali- those 14 different qualifications here, there's a couple things that I wanna point out. There's a couple things that I want you to notice. First is that there is no requirement for a Bible college or seminary degree. Of course, there were none of those back then. There is no requirement for pastoral licensure or ordination, it wasn't required. The only skill required for this is an ability to teach, which we already said can be learned, right? It's not like I'm born with it or I'm not born with it. We can grow in it. The rest of the qualifications are all about character. And so listen, don't, don't like, think about that for a minute. In Paul's eyes, as he's moved by the Holy Spirit to write these things, Far and away, the most important qualifications to be a leader in the church is godly character. The leaders of the church should be godly men. Here's my point. Godly character is the main qualification for elders. Godly character is the main qualification for elders. Now, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about how that compares to what we expect and respect from other leaders in our world. Like, think about business leaders. Think about leaders in academia. Think about what we expect from the leaders in our government. And too often, what we expect from the leaders in our church. What do we value? What do, in, our, in our Western thinking, what do we value? Well, you gotta be somebody with great abilities. You gotta be somebody with great intelligence. You have to be somebody with great charisma, great strength, great tenacity, great vision. You have to be a great visionary to be a strong leader. The Bible says, look for somebody who's gentle. Look for somebody who's temperate, who's self-controlled, who's hospitable to outsiders. Look for somebody who's not in love with money who can be detached from their possessions. Look for people that are good husbands. Look for people that are good daddies. Look for people full of the spirit and full of wisdom. That's pretty different, right? That's what you should expect. Like as we get to the point in the life of our church, not too far down the road, where we need to start raising up elders among us, These are the things that we should look for. These are the things that we should expect. And by the way, you should be expecting them and seeing them in the life of the pastoral staff already here. And I would say even broader, the staff in general. We should be people of godly character, not not perfect, not sinless, not faultless, but chasing hard after Jesus and working hard to live like him. So... Before I wrap up, give me five more minutes. Let me me quickly comment. I think I can do this quickly on the heart of an elder. So these are the qualifications, but I want to read you one more passage and I'll just give you the point on the heart of an elder. So this is in 1 Peter 5. We'll put it up on the screen. 1 Peter 5, starting in verse 1. So this is, this is Peter writing, and he's writing to a church, the, the, kind of the broad church of a lot of people who are suffering and struggling. And this is what he writes. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. Here's what he says, verse two. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. And he says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. For time's sake, let me just just tell you what my point is here with the heart of an elder. The heart of an elder is a shepherd who loves and cares for his flock willingly selflessly, generously, and humbly. Not only is he all of the things that we just discussed in 1, Peter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter three, not only is he someone full of the spirit and full of wisdom, 
but he's somebody that he's a shepherd that loves and cares for the flock willingly, selflessly, generously, and humbly. He should willingly serve, not for personal gain, not for, for, per, for selfish interests, but selflessly. He should be generous with his love and care for the congregation. That's a beautiful thought. Generous with his love and care for the congregation. He should be humble and others-centered, never making it about himself. He should be willing to lay down his life for his sheep, for the flock, just like our good shepherd Jesus did. Probably not literally in death, but more by sacrificial decision, by sacrificial decision, according to the needs of the church. That's the heart of an elder, overseer, pastor that Jesus calls us to. And, and let me just end where I started. Again, it's, it's fascinating. Hopefully you saw this as we, dig into, as we dug into it. Like all of these things, pretty much, maybe not the recent convert, but all of these things are talked about in other places for all of us. Like we're supposed to live these things out. The accountability for, for elders is higher but the standard is the same for each and every one of us. I, was in, uh, I do a, a little men's group on Saturday morning. We were in Colossians. We were in Colossians chapter 3. And Colossians chapter 3 is, talks about a ton of these. One of them teaching. The expectation that all of us actually should be teaching each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know that passage, right? It's not just for the leaders of the church, all of these things. But here's what I'd say. The elders should be good albeit imperfect, good living examples for the congregation. So here's, here's, that's my last point. Elders are to be living examples for the church of lives well lived for Christ. The standard is the same. They're just held more accountable to it. But they're to be examples for all of us to look at and go, that's how I want to live my life. I like how he conducts himself. I like how he loves people. I like how generous he is with his time. I love how selfless he is, not trying to, to bring you know, attention to him, but diverting and recognizing other people. And I'll tell you personally, much of the man that I am today is because I had this in my life. Other pastor elders, guys here at the chapel over the last years, guys at my previous church, Grace Church, who lived exemplary lives that I could look at and learn from and go, I want to be like that. And I'll tell you this too. This is where I'll end. And that's what I want to be for the next generation, right? And this church is filled with many, many other ministry leaders that are committed to the same thing. I want to be a godly example of a, of a life well lived that the next generation looks up to. And I, I pray you feel the same. I pray you feel the same. That the next generation can look up to and go, I want to be like them. That's how I want to live my life. Amen? Amen. Lord... Lord, may we be that. May we be those kind of people. May we be those kind of followers of you. May we be those kinds of priests. God, we recognize that you will raise some up here to, to shepherd, to lead us. God, to, to use their wisdom and experience to move us forward as a church. We recognize that. But Father, I pray that each of us would take these things very personally and look at our lives and go, am I living this way? Am I following Jesus this way? Because there are people watching us. We saw a beautiful example of, of the young folks getting baptized today. They're watching. Will we be people of godly character that they could look up to and follow us as we follow you, Jesus? Help us to do that. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us. Father, we love you more than anything. In Christ's name. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.